Hello everyone, welcome to our webinar today on behalf of the Maine Lung Cancer Coalition and Quality Counts of Quality Company. Uh, my name is Jessica Rita, I'm the Quality Improvement Manager here at Quality Counts and we're so happy to have you all here to join us today for our next webinar in the series for the Maine Lung Cancer Coalition. We'd like to acknowledge our funders with, without which this would not be possible. So we are so grateful for their support. We'd like to thank the Bristol Mills Scrub Foundation, the Maine Cancer Foundation, and the Maine Economic Improvement Fund. Thank you so much. Today, we are so excited to have Dr. Bill Black, Dr. William Black. He, and the title is the CT Lung Cancer Screening in 2019, What's New? So we are so excited to have him presenting for us today and all of you join us. So just a couple of housekeeping things together. Webinar logistics for Zoom. So right now, all the audio lines for all of you and non-presenters are currently muted. Please use the chat box for any questions or comments throughout the presentation. We will have questions at the end of the presentation. And also, if you're requesting a CME for this webinar and you did not sign in to Zoom through a direct link, or if you're watching as part of a group, you could please email us at mlcc at mainqualitycounts.org during or immediately after the webinar so we can track your participation. That would be great. You can also put it in the chat box as well. So today, speaker disclosure is in for CME certificates. For the disclosure today, the speaker today does not have any relevant financial relationships with the manufacturers of any commercial products and or provider of commercial services discussed in this CME activity. A CME evaluation survey will be sent after the learning session via email. Please complete the survey via SurveyMonkey. It's a very quick survey within one week. And then a CME certificate will be emailed within one month of completion of the survey. So let's get started. So today, again, we are so excited to have Dr. William Black. He is a professor of radiology and of community and family medicine at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center and a member of the Dartmouth Institute. He is one of the site principal investigators at um, Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center and a member of the executive committee. Dr. Black played a major role in the design, execution, and analysis of the National Lung Cancer National Lung excuse me, Screening Trial, the NSLT, and led the cost-effective analysis related to lung cancer screening in the NSLT and was a consultant to the lung group of the Cancer Intervention and Surveillance Network. He currently serves on several American College of Radiology committees related to lung cancer screening and leads the lung cancer screening program at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. We are so happy to have you, Dr. Black, and I'm gonna turn now this uh, presentation over to you. All right, I will hit the share button. And I'll open my slides and uh, hopefully everything will be working here in a second. All right, I think I have my slides up now. Um, and I was planning to talk for about 35 to 40 minutes and leave about 15 to 20 minutes for uh, questions at the end. Is that reasonable? That sounds perfect, thank you. All right, well, thank you everybody for listening to me for the next 45 minutes or 40 minutes or so. Um, as Jessica said, I'm gonna be talking about lung cancer screening and what's new in 2019. Uh, I have no financial disclosures as already mentioned. Um, however, I was a co-investigator for the NLST and I am a member of the American College of Radiology at Lung RADS and Lung Cancer Screening Registry Committees. So I have some investment in lung cancer screening. Uh, over the next uh, 35, 40 minutes, I'm going to give you a little background on lung cancer screening, and then I'm going to talk to you about the current status, and I'm going to finish up with upcoming developments that are expected in the remainder of the 20, in 2019. So let me just start off with some basic facts that I'm sure everybody is aware of. Um, leading, uh, lung cancer is by far and away the leading cause of cancer death in the United States. It is estimated that over 150,000 uh, people died from lung cancer in 2018. Uh, if you look at the three most uh, deadly other can next cancers, pancreas, breast, and colon, they add up to only 135,000. So lung cancer towers over everything in terms of causing cancer death. Overall, the five-year survival is about 19%, and that's because usually when lung cancer is uh, diagnosed, it's advanced. And it's uh, believed that cigarette smoking causes about 80 to 90% of lung cancers, a little bit higher percentage in men than women. So I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna start off now talking about the National Lung Screening Trial. 
because that is the main study on which screening in the United States is currently based. Uh, this was a large prospective randomized trial of over 50,000 individuals at high risk for lung cancer. The participants were randomized in one-to-one -one fashion to a screening with low-dose CT versus PA chest radiograph. And there were three annual screens. The primary endpoint for the study was lung cancer mortality, but we included many other endpoints, including all-cause mortality. The eligibility included the following. Um, no symptoms of lung cancer, age 55 to 74, greater than or equal to a 30-pack year history of smoking, no prior history of lung cancer, and the patients had to be, or the participants had to be medically fit for lung cancer surgery. Now, the major benefits that were found in the National Lung Screening Trial were a 20% relative risk reduction in lung cancer mortality, and a 7% relative risk reduction in all-cause mortality. Both of these were statistically significant. And this is really the, this is the only screening intervention that has ever been shown to cause a statistically significant reduction in all-cause mortality. And the reason it was achieved in the National Lung Screening Trials because a high percentage of the target population of the participants died of lung cancer. 25% of all the deaths that occurred in the NLST were due to lung cancer. When you're screened for other uh, entities such as breast cancer or colon, usually your screened population has a much lower probability of dying from the target disease. So because we can identify the risk factors for lung cancer screening, it's particularly efficient. Now, uh, a lot of people like to uh, look at not just relative risk reduction, but the absolute risk reduction, which takes into account how prevalent the condition is. And to calculate the absolute risk reduction related to lung cancer screening and the NLST, uh, we looked at the number of deaths in the uh, control group, which was 425, divided by the number of person years, and subtracted from that the number of deaths in the uh, screen group, divided by the number of person years, and you can see a number of 0 0.0031. It probably doesn't look that impressive to most people, but the reciprocal, but that relates to that corresponds to about three lives saved per thousand screened over three years. Uh, now you can just take the reciprocal of that number to get the number needed to screen to prevent one lung cancer death, and so the reciprocal of that is 320. So in other words, you need to screen 320 people for three annual screens to see a uh, a benefit in terms of preventing lung, lung cancer death. Um, that may sound uh, like a lot of people. However, lung cancer screening compares favorably to all other forms of screening. And in fact, if you look, if you consider screening over the lifetime of the adult when they're eligible and compare lung cancer screening to mammography screening, you can see that to prevent one cancer death with lung cancer screening, you only need to screen 39 people from ages 55 to 80, whereas for mammography, even over a longer screening interval from 40 to 84, you need to screen 84 people. Similarly, you need to screen fewer people to gain one life year uh, or to prevent uh, one year of lost life, only 3.7 for lung cancer screening and 5.3. Again, the reason you can achieve this efficiency with lung cancer screening is because there is a very readily identified risk identifiable risk factor of, of smoking. Whereas in mammography, it really pertains to uh, pretty much all women. However, there are also harms of CT screening for lung cancer. Uh, the most common one is a false positive screening result. Uh, other harms include overdiagnosis, which is a diagnosis of a condition that would not have become clinically relevant had it been not detected in screening. And then the radiation exposure associated with it. The CT scan. In terms of false positive results in the National Lung Screening Trial, 27% of the participants had a positive first round of screening. I had a false positive at first round of screening. However, the most common follow up was a, simply a single low dose CT, nothing invasive. Only less than 7% of the patients who were, were false positive had an invasive procedure. Overdiagnosis, uh, we saw, we did see more lung cancers diagnosed in the CT than chest X-ray arm at the end of the uh, 6.5 years of follow-up, 
we had more than 100 more cancers uh, in the CT arm. Uh, this corresponds to a, a approximately 18% 18, 18 estimate of uh, screen-detected lung cancers were due to overdiagnosis. So you'll commonly see it reported that the overdiagnosis rate for lung cancer screening is 18% based on the NLST. Um, however, that number represents what we could estimate uh, at 6.5 years after the trial. There's going to be a follow-up uh, publication on the NLST that's going to provide a much more accurate estimate of overdiagnosis than what we had at this time. We, we have additional six years of follow-up in the next paper, and that will give you a much more accurate assessment of what the overdiagnosis is. Um, also, the rates of overdiagnosis were much higher for the small cancers, the adenocarcinoma in situ and the minimally invasive adenocarcinomas, uh, than for the, uh, the solid nodules, 49% versus 3%. Radiation exposure, uh, the effective dose of low dose screening CT is about what, 1.4 millisieverts in the NLST. To put that in some perspective, a standard chest CT is about seven millisieverts or five times as much. Look at background radiation to the, uh, the people living in the United States at sea level, it's about three millisieverts per year. So the CT scan dose is about half of what you get from the background over a year. It's also been estimated with modeling uh, that CT screening for lung cancer would prevent at least 20 times more lung cancer deaths than it would cause, at least in those people who are eligible for screening. Uh, the benefit risk uh, ratio is least favorable for younger women with fewer pack years. So when you get into around age 50, the women who have fewer pack years, that's when you start having to seriously consider the radiation risk. So in summary, the National Lung Screening Trial was a randomized trial of over 50,000 individuals at high risk. Uh, there was a 20% relative risk reduction, lung cancer mortality, and a statistically significant 7% all-cause mortality reduction. The baseline false positive rate was 27%, and the overdiagnosis rate was estimated to be 18%, but as I said before, there's a follow-up study coming out in 2019 that will uh, provide a much better estimate. So uh, largely, mainly because of this National Lung Screening Trial, the U.S. Printer Task Force came out with a recommendation for annual screening for lung cancer with low-dose CT in adults ages 55 to 80 years of age who have a 30-pack year history of smoking and currently smoke or have quit within the past 15 years. So they basically, the U.S. Printer Task Force just adopted the the entry criteria that we use for the National Lung Screening Trial. And uh, they, did, they did a lot of modeling, or they relied on a lot of modeling that was done for them to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, ask, to see what populations would be best served, and that's how they got to the 80 years upper limit. Uh, however, they did say that the screening should be discontinued once a person has not smoked for 15 years or develops a health problem that substantially limits life expectancy or the ability or willingness to have curative lung surgery. They gave it a grade B recommendation, which means that private insurers must cover it without any co-pays. They also had other considerations. They said it, the lung cancer screening should be coupled with smoking cessation efforts. Uh, there should be a shared decision-making process so uh, participants know what they're really getting into. Uh, and uh, there should be standardization of the CT screening of, in terms of low dose and follow-up. And there should be a development of a lung cancer screening registry, which has happened. Uh, now, sh sh one of the major concerns um, after the U.S. Nerve Task Force guidelines came out was that uh, there may be a, was a, the, the false positive rate being so high. And a lot of people were not in favor of proceeding with lung cancer screening because of the false, the high false positive rate. So one thing that was done by the American College of Radiology was uh, put a panel together, which included me, to come up with uh, guidelines for how we should be reading these CT scans. And so um, uh, the, this, this committee was charged with standardizing the reporting, reducing confusion, and facilitating outcome moderate, moderating, monitoring. Um, so one of the things that we did was we changed the 
positivity criterion. In the NLST, we had a positivity criterion of greater than four millimeters in diameter for the nodules. In lung rads, we changed to six millimeters. Now that might seem trivial, but in fact, that little change from four millimeters to six millimeters reduced the false positive rate at baseline more than 50%, from 27% to 13%. Uh, this is just a one-page summary of the uh, cheat sheet from the um, Lung Rads version 1.0, which I used to keep at my workstation whenever I was reading a screening CT so that I would know how I should report the findings and what I should recommend. Um, now, since screening started in 2015, or since the U.S. Parent Task Force recommended that screening be considered in those who are eligible, the number of screens that were performed and, and uh, submitted to the Lung Cancer Screening Registry has dramatically increased. So let me back up a second. As I said before, the U.S. Program Task Force recommended the creation of a screening registry. Uh, also, uh, CMS has required for reimbursement that uh, scans that are performed get submitted to a national registry for lung cancer screening. And at this point in time, there is only one national registry, and that's the American College of Radiology Lung Cancer Screening Registry. And, the, and that registry actually requires that all uh, practices that submit to them submit not just their Medicare patient exams, but all exams. So consequently, this registry contains all the screening exams that are legitimately done in the United States. We, there's no other screening intervention for which we have one registry that's so comprehensive. So looking at this registry will give us a good idea of what's happening with lung cancer screening throughout the US. But as I was saying, since 2015, you can see there's been a fairly dramatic increase in the number of exams done and submitted to the lung cancer screening registry. However, this represents a pretty small fraction of all people who are eligible in the US. Uh, last summer, there was a presentation at the ASCO meeting uh, looking at the number of people who were eligible uh, for lung cancer screening based on the National Cancer um, Screening uh, uh, Health uh, Interview. Uh, one of those national national health interview screen uh, uh, surveys, and and they knew how many people were screened from the ACR registry, and when they did that, they were actually using data from 2016, not the data that we have today, and using that data from 2016, uh, they were they had the number of people who were eligible across the country is over 7.6 million. The number screened of 141, so only 2% by their uh, estimation were being screened for lung cancer screening. Only 2% of those eligible in the U.S. were being screened. Uh, now, in all fairness, if we go back and look at our numbers from the lung cancer screening registry, you can see since 2016, the number of scans has really tripled. So consequently, I think a better estimate for the uh, proportion of the eligible population that's being screened today is about 6% rather than 2%. Still though, a very, very low percentage, much lower than what we have for uh, breast cancer screening or colon cancer screening. Now, why is the uptake so low? Uh, well, the investigators have commented on a number of things. One is there's generally, there's a lack of knowledge among the, the patients who are eligible for screening about the screening option. There's also a lot, lack of knowledge among within the medical community. There's lack of access because not every uh, hospital or clinic will have uh, be up to speed for lung cancer screening. Uh, there's also a problem with the reimbursement being pretty low. Uh, and also, there's it's been a limited time since the U.S. Task Force and CMS came out with their guidelines and recommendations. Just a few years. Uh, furthermore, lung cancer screening is a multi-step time-consuming, complicated process. You need to do an eligibility assessment, which means you have to have accurate information on patient smoking history. Uh, we, we need to know how much the patient smoked and over what time frame. And this information, although ideally should be in the electronic medical records, uh, often the information is incomplete or inaccurate. You also have a shared decision-making process, which takes about a half an hour. 
uh, and it requires somebody who's knowledgeable about the shared decision making in general and also knowledgeable about lung cancer screening specifically. It also requires this tobacco cessation effort. And all these things must be documented in the electronic medical record. Uh, the, the lung cancer, the actually CT screening or scanning is the easy part. And then you have the interpretation of the scan using the structured reporting system from lung rads. And then we have patient and provider communication and patient management and then data submission to the lung cancer screening registry. So it's much, much more involved than any other type of screening or any other type of radiology exam. And the reimbursement is lower. So just to give you an idea of what the reimbursements are like, uh, this is from 2018, uh, uh, the latest data available. You can see for smoking cessation, for three to 10 minutes, the total reimbursement is $51. Uh, for 10 minutes, it's $65. For lung cancer screening shared decision making, it's $111. For the CT scan, it's $125. Uh, for screening MAMO, it's $138. And for a regular chest CT without contrast, where there's no screening going on, which is actually a whole lot easier, it's $166. And this has um, been an issue. It's, still, it's currently an issue. So what do we expect in 2019? Well, uh, well, we already have a new version of lung rats that was just uh, recently uh, posted on the internet. It's version 1.1 and includes several new features. One is uh, perifisural nodules. These are little nodules that are associated with the minor and major fissures. And we know from many screening studies uh, that have looked at these nodules that virtually none of them turn out to be malignant. In fact, and if you look at all the studies that have been done, there's about 800 nodules that have been followed and none of them have turned out to be malignant. So consequently, when we see these nodules, which actually constitute a pretty large percentage of all the nodules we do see, we just call them perifisural and we consider them benign and they don't need any further workup. So that helps reduce the false positive rate. We've also raised the size threshold for non-solid -sol nodules from 20 millimeters to 30 millimeters before we call it positive. Uh, we've slightly modified the management for new large nodules that would otherwise be considered 4B and might go to CT or biopsy or PET or biopsy. And for these, we just get a short-term follow-up because it turns out a lot of the, the new, not, new large nodules are inflammation or not neoplastic. We've uh, changed the way we measure the diameter. Again, this may sound trivial. We include the first decimal place. Um, a lot of other societies don't. They, they round. And the problem when you round is everything that's over 5.5 millimeters, uh, anything between 5.5 and 6 gets counted to 6. And so you end up uh, um, calling positive a lot of nodules that otherwise would be negative. And then we've also endorsed volumetric measurements. That's what we use here at uh, DHMC for any nodule that's over six millimeters. And the reason we do that is because volumetric measurements, especially when they're automated, are a lot much more accurate than the uh, two-dimensional measurements that we do with hand calipers. Uh, right now, most screening places are not implementing volumetric measurements because it is a little bit cumbersome. It does require additional software but many are using it, including Dartmouth Hitchcock. And this just shows you the one page cheat sheet that we have for the new version of 1.1 lung rads, which this is at now replaced the old 1.0 version of lung rads that I used to use. You see, there's a lot of, a lot of small detail, a lot of small print. Let me just give you an example of a screening exam. Um, here's a patient, a 58-year-old female current smoker who has a nodule in the uh, right upper lobe. Uh, we, I use the volumetric software that we have, and you can see you can get various measurements on the volume, effective diameter, which is the same thing as the average diameter, maximum diameter, short axis diameter. Um, and and we, all, but we also have now, and what Lung Rads recommends, is that we use a lung cancer risk calculator uh, 
that enables us to give you some quantitative estimate of what the probability of lung cancer is. So in this particular case, oh, let me go back. The, the calculator is based on two high-risk screening populations in Canada, and it calculates lung cancer risk at first screen. And it uses both patient and nodule characteristics, three of each. And it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So what we would, and what one of the things that they included in their publication was uh, uh, were supplements that included spreadsheets so that you could actually calculate the or apply their model to calculate the, the, the risk of lung cancer. So in this in this previous example, this woman, she's 58 years of age. Uh, you can say she's a woman, so she actually counts against her for lung cancer screening. The nodule size is seven points, the maximum diameter of the nodule size is 7.6 millimeters. It is solid, it's upper lobe, and it's not speculated, and it's just one. And putting this information into the calculator, we get a probability of lung cancer of 4.5%. So whenever I have a positive screen, uh, uh, I use this calculator to estimate the probability of lung cancer because I think that's often very reassuring for the, uh, for the lung, lung RADS 3 category in particular, where the probability of lung cancer is low and you don't wanna really alarm either the provider or the patient with the report of a positive screening exam. Uh, another thing that's gonna be coming out in 2019, uh, this is the follow-up uh, study for the National Lung Screening Trial. As I said before, the median follow-up with the original publication was 6.5 years from randomization. With its extended follow-up, we'll have 11 to 12 years from randomization. And this was accomplished with linkage to state cancer registries and the National Death Index. And the purpose of this follow-up study was to, one, confirm lung cancer mortality reduction to show that it wasn't just a temporary uh, a decrease in lung cancer mortality that it stayed, and two, to reassess the overdiagnosis. Because as I said before, with the very short-term follow-up, you don't know how many, uh, it's really hard to estimate overdiagnosis. You really need long-term follow-up to figure this out. And the initial estimate you get at the end of the, at the early part of the follow-up is going to be much, much higher in the long-term follow-up. So I can't tell you what the actual number is now, even though I do know it, uh, but I can tell you it is lower than the 18% that I've already presented. The other um, uh, important news that will be coming out soon is uh, a publication on the Nelson trial, which was uh, from the Netherlands. This has already been presented at a meeting in fall of 2018, so the, the information I'm gonna show you is, is in the public domain. We just don't have the final publication. This is a randomized trial of over 15,000 individuals at high risk, although they were not as high risk as in the National Lung Screening Trial. The, the patients were a little bit younger and the smoking criteria were a little bit less. Uh, nevertheless, it actually showed a greater reduction in lung cancer mortality for men and a much greater reduction for women, although the difference between men and women was not statistically significant because there were so few women in the trial. It also showed an overall 5% all-cause mortality reduction and a baseline false positive rate lower than in the NLST. And as I said before, this publication is expected to be out in sometime in the remainder of 2019. Why, why do I think the Nelson trial did better than the NLST? Um, I think there's several explanations. Uh, one is that the Nelson trial actually had more rounds of screening than NLST. They had four rounds rather than three rounds. Um, initially in NLST, we wanted six rounds. Uh, the reason we set, settled for three was because of lack of funding. The other thing in the Nelson trial, there was no chest X-ray screening in a control arm as there was in NLST. And to the extent that chest X-ray screening provided some benefit in the NLST, that would have led to an underestimation of the benefit of CT screening. And the Nelson trial did not have any chest X-ray screening in the control arm. Also in the Nelson trial, it was a very, it was a very homogeneous study. There were far fewer sites than in the NLST. I think there were 12 sites as opposed to 30. Uh, they uh, used the exact same equipment as far as CT scanners and software, and the, and the uh, exams were read centrally. 
They also did, did a very systematic workup using volumetric doubling times, as I just showed you a minute ago. And there also may be some chance element as to why we see different results between Nelson and LST. But the important point here is that there were only there have only been two randomized trials of lung cancer screening that have been large enough to determine if lung cancer screening can work. And both of those trials, the NLST and the Nelson trial, have both shown benefit. The trials that have not shown benefit were small and underpowered. And lastly, what we expect in the end of, by the end of 2019 or early 2020 is an update from the US Benefit Services Task Force. They are currently working on this and they want to reestimate the benefits and harms. They want to reconsider eligibility criteria. Now, one of the uh, things they want to consider is whether or not we should move from the uh, pack years criteria and age to a more sophisticated uh, risk model uh, that has been shown to be more efficient. Uh, they want to, the U.S. Permanent Task Force wants to uh, consider some of these barriers to screening to see if there's something that can be done to uh, alleviate them. Uh, they're all, we're also looking at the effectiveness of different types of smoking cessation interventions. And the, and the U.S. Permanent Task Force is relying on extensive decision modeling from an organization called CISNET, uh, which was involved with the first um, the initial uh, guidelines that came out of the U.S. Preventive Task Force for lung cancer screening, as well as breast cancer screening and other interventions. So again, uh, we expect this to be coming out sometime uh, with, with, by the end of 2019 or early 2020, uh, and this will definitely have a huge impact on how lung cancer screening will proceed. So in summary, uh, lung cancer screening with CT has been proven effective in the NLST and Nelson trial. However, it's a multi-step labor-intensive process um, that is difficult to do. And consequently, the national uptake right now, I estimate to be only about 6%. Uh, pending in 2019 are as extended follow-up of the NLST, the final results of the Nelson trial, and the update on the US Preventive Services Task Force. Uh, I've left a couple, uh, useful resources here, uh, websites that you may want to go to. Uh, the, the one that's best in terms of general information for lung cancer screening is the ACR website. Uh, there's a nice uh, online uh, decision aid uh, called Should I Screen? Uh, that's been used effectively by many different departments. Um, and then there's a, a localizer that enables you to uh, localize a accredited uh, lung cancer screening facility uh, by zip code or location. And I think I will stop there and I will try to answer any questions that people may have. Thank you so much, Dr. Black. This is a terrific presentation with so much information. And so we are going to go into some questions. So I will start. So right now we have um, a question that states that this person will be interested in Dr. Black's thoughts about the value of the required shared decision-making visit before lung cancer screening. Um, well, I actually am a long-standing proponent of shared decision-making. I came to Dartmouth in 1991 when uh, shared decision-making was really getting started. So, and I think one of the major advanced uh, benefits of shared decision making is that it, it clarifies that this is a decision that the patient can make. And it also helps um, the, the clinician understand what might be some of the issues that may be uh, related to this decision. Uh, that being, even though, so I'm, even though I'm a huge fan of uh, shared decision making in principle, I do recognize that it has been a huge barrier, maybe the single biggest barrier, to effective lung cancer screening in the U.S. So uh, I think there are things that could be done. I think we could do a much better job of standardizing the shared decision making and making it more efficient. I think right, right now what we do basically, right, right now what we require is that every single referring physician uh, learn how to do shared decision making. And stop what they're doing in the middle of their practice to do a shared decision making. And it's just not practical. 
I think it, we could use, um, uh, I think it could be a national effort so that this the shared decision making could be enhanced with some type of um, computer assistance so that you could take into account the individual characteristics of, of the patient, their age, their sex, their smoking history, to get more relevant information to the patient. Right now, some of the tools basically are just a summary of what happened in these large trials. They're not specific to the individual, so they may not be that helpful. In fact, they may be very misleading in some cases. So bottom line is I'm a big believer in shared decision making, but I think we really need to improve the process of shared decision making, both in terms of accuracy and efficiency. Terrific, thank you. And I would encourage anyone who has any other questions to please put them in the chat box at this time. So we'll give people a chance to do that. I was interested, Dr. Black, when you mentioned that the national uptake, that really struck me as 6%. And, you know, kind of just maybe some thoughts around that. So, you know, obviously the work that we do, you know, trying to educate providers and clinical staff around lung cancer screening. Just any kind of general thoughts around why you think that is? Well, again, I think it's because it's a very labor intensive process right now. Mm -hmm. And, and, yeah. and people have not had to do this before, um, go through a shared decision making process. Mm -hmm. Back, it used to be, the screening used to be more coercive where you basically you just tell people they should get screened, that's it. Uh, whereas now you have to stop and tell them they have an option and then get into this complicated uh, uh, discussion of all the benefits and harms. Uh, but again, I, th I think this could be improved by having a, a more uh, efficient and accurate shared decision making process. Uh, and it might require some tweaking with reimbursement so that um, a center can stay financially afloat when they're doing lung cancer screening. That's, I, know, I know a lot of places have just decided not to do lung cancer screening because um, the money loser. Absolutely. So we have another question kind of along these same lines. And the question was, do you anticipate any streamlining? So like you had said, making it more efficient, do you anticipate any streamlining of the shared decision-making process? So again, so it, it won't be so, so timely, time, you know, time consuming. Well, I, I do know that a lot of people are pushing for that. that. That's what I do know. I don't know exactly how the U.S. Center of Task Force or CMS will respond. Uh, and Right now, like I said, with the U.S. Center Task Force, they're, um, they're just starting to digest information. They haven't come to any preliminary decision. What, the, what they will probably do is before they come up with their final uh, ruling, they will uh, come up with a tentative ruling and put, make it public for a month or so and take feedback um, and then come mm -hmm. up with a final ruling. But I do know that there are lots of people, lots of organizations that are pushing to make it more streamlined, but I just don't know how what the response is going to be. I'm not privy to that. And if I were, I probably couldn't tell you. <laughs> Great, thank you. So we have some more questions coming in. So another one says that it appears that early screening remains an effective tool in diagnosing lung cancer, and that is good. The problem that I'm hearing is the complexity of the complexity of screening the patient to be referred to the low dose CT scan. What can be done to streamline this process to help get high risk patients screened? Well, one of the things that's been shown to be most effective at um, medical centers is to have a um, it's a, um, I'm blocking on the name right now. There's a like a navigator. A, a navigator, or there's a best practice alert, the BPA. So when, a, when a, uh, one of our primary care docs um, sees the patient at their visit, um, they have best practice alert on. So that, that will flag patients who are in the right age group and have some smoking history. So they'll be, a, the, the provider will be alerted that this patient might be eligible for lung cancer screening. It doesn't tell them they are, but it tells them they might be. So the provider knows to, uh, has the option then of asking some questions to further determine eligibility. And we use this at Dartmouth 
Uh, right now, it is only available though to primary care and general internal medicine. It's not available to the subspecialties, subspecialties because of some of the technical difficulties with the EMR. Uh, but I know at Dartmouth and I know throughout the country, this has been shown to be the single most effective intervention for increasing the awareness of lung cancer screening, referrals to lung cancer screening. Excellent, so that prompt right when they're in with the patient. So yeah, that's great, thank you. Another question that we have is, what are the harms shared with patients regarding the screening? Okay, and this is gonna depend on what shared decision-making tools are used. Um, at, right now, there are several national tools that are available, including uh, the Should I Screen tool that I mentioned before that's online. The AHRQ has a very um, complete uh, decision aid that's available online. Uh, although I can tell you it's very, very uh, long, and it would probably take a provider about an hour to get through it the first time, just so the provider knew what was going on. Uh, and that certainly, that mentions all the harms that I mentioned. It mentions the false positives. It mentions the overdiagnosis of radiation. Uh, the problem with uh, all of the existing national tools is they haven't been upgraded with lung rads data. Uh, now, I know with the, U, with the new U.S. Parent Task Force guidelines, they're going to have the new lung rads data, so they'll be able to, to update some of that. Uh, so. Right now, the national guidelines, um, like I said, they're not up to date with terms of lung rads, and they don't, they don't really, they don't give a, they're not individualized, so they don't give, they don't tell an individual how they're likely to benefit or, or be harmed over the short term uh, or, or long term. They just basically say for a population, this how many people. So we, we have a decision aid at Dartmouth that we was that's based on a national screening trial. So we will tell people out of a thousand, you know, you'll have three fewer lung cancer deaths. Uh, you'll have about a hundred positive at the first screen and you'll have about four overdiagnosed cases. Those numbers will have to be revised as we get the follow-up data from NLST uh, right. published. Uh, but what's also happening at a lot of other places, they're just using their own uh, medical center uh, guidelines that they put together, our shared decision-making products that they put together. And there is, is no, I'm not aware of any um, a quality control on that. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure what's being told to people at all the different places in, in the U.S. I'm sure there are some tools that are not that accurate. So again, this is something that ideally uh, would be nationalized so that you can go one, everyone go to the same place Mm -hmm. Same information, so it doesn't matter if you're in Ohio or Virginia or New Hampshire, Vermont. Uh, if, if you put in the same information, you get the same uh, information back in terms of what are your potential benefits and potential risks. And ideally, you'd be able to look at it in different uh, time horizons. Uh, that's sort of pie in the sky right now. That's what what I would advocate. Uh, I think I think we have the capability of doing this. Whether or not there's a will and the financial support is no matter. Great, thank you. So the next question. In Maine, we are finding that many eligible patients are not interested in screening. Do you find that in New Hampshire? And if so, any thoughts about addressing that? Thank you. Um, sure, there are some people who are not interested and who are eligible. Uh, some of the reasons include uh, one of perception that one of the major things is that a lot of people perceive that it's not going to help them, that they're, they're just going to get a, a treatment, they're not going to live any better, they're just going to suffer from the treatment. So that's one misconception. Another misconception is that they, they think they already have it, they don't want to know early because they're just going to suffer longer with the diagnosis. And then there's some other practical issues. Um, most of the patients who are eligible live a, f a fair distance from their closest screening center. And so the way we're trying to address that at Dartmouth is by allowing some of the more peripheral sites to uh, do the screenings, and then we would read them centrally, and, and allow actually patients to do video conference with the decision-making and the eligibility assessment. That way we re reduce that, that huge 
travel burden. I think there's another, there's a very legitimate concern and that is cost. And even though I said that the screening itself is, should be free, uh, from, covered by Medicare or private insurance, what those insurers don't cover are, is the follow-up if there's a positive. So if you know, you're really concerned that it's gonna be a positive screen. And incidentally, there's been a lot of misinformation about the false positive rate on lung cancer screening. In fact, you can go to very reputable journals. Some of you may have heard the New England Journal or JAMA. Uh, and there's a lot of misinformation about how high the false positive rate is. And that's because they're confusing the false positive rate with one minus the positive predicted value. And so you, there's actually a recent journal watch from New England Journal that cited a 97% false positive rate from a VA study which is complete nonsense. And what that is, again, it's a one minus the positive predicted value. The actual false positive rate at the VA was bad. It was like 60%, much, much higher than we have at Dartmouth, which is under 10%. Uh, but it's, but it's, so there's a lot of misinformation about the false positive rate. So I think what you would really have to do is make sure, uh, these people say they really don't want it. It may be because they haven't really been properly informed about the benefits and harms. Again, this is where it would be re really critical to have a central, pro I think, a central process for shared decision making where we consistently and properly inform people about the benefits and harms. But that being said, I think it's legitimate for some people, uh, especially when we're close trade off between benefits and harms, to say, no, it's not for me. And there are going to be some people where the trade offs are, are pretty close. You know, if the, for a younger patient, for a female with a lower smoking history, it may, it, it may not be good. Or even for a very older patient who has a limited life expectancy, it may not be worthwhile. Um, so, yeah, I do think it makes sense to take, to consider all these individual characteristics when you're making a decision. But I think I'm guessing that a lot of the people who choose not to don't have all the accurate information. Great, thank you so much. So the next question, do you find more providers are getting on board with, a, um, with Lodo CT? One of my biggest barriers is a negative response from providers. Yes, and it depends again very much on who you're surrounded by. I am very fortunate here at Dartmouth to be working very closely with the chair of primary care medicine. So, and uh, so, and she's been very receptive to the information that we have, and it's been eye-opening to her. Uh, and so she's also a strong believer in shared decision-making. And because of her, I think, largely because of her leadership, um, I think the primary care and GIM uh, physicians at Dartmouth are more open-minded about considering um, the potential benefits of lung cancer screening. I'm also giving a medical grand rounds on the subject uh, uh, in about six months. Um, I can say also that uh, there has been some misinformation. We had a, a national speaker come about six months ago who inappropriately cited that 97% false positive rate. Uh, and so something like that does a whole lot of harm, you know, to the providers in the room um, who come over thinking, my God, why am I doing any of this? But, um, like I said, I, I think it's probably going to depend very much on your particular population. There are many places where the providers, the, the non-radiologists, the, uh, the primary care docs, are very enthusiastic, but there are many places where they're not. And again, it comes down to, you know, having accurate information. Great. Thank you. I guess the other thing I should say is it depends, too, on the performance and fairness to the, to the critics of lung cancer screening. One of the big criticisms is that, okay, this is great in the NLST and maybe even the Nelson trial, but how do we know we have that quality at the local screening center down the street? And quite honestly, you don't know that. And so, again, this is why it's really important to standardize all this. Make sure that screening is being done well, not just at some, at some good centers, but, you know, uniformly. And we will have access to this information through the Lung Cancer Screening Registry. But this certainly is a legitimate concern for providers 
that you know their particular screening center might not, or the one that's closest to them, might not be up to speed. So ideally, they should be able to talk to the screening center to provide them with some information on their positivity rates, for example. What are your positivity rates compared to the, the nation? It doesn't really matter how good it was in NLST. If it's not doing, uh, you're not doing it that well at your local site, then you have reason to not want to proceed. Of course, it depends also on the quality of the surgery. How, how safe and how effective is the surgery that's, that's going to be available to the patient. So these are very legitimate concerns. Great. Thank you, Dr. Black. The next question. Can you say more about what is involved in overdiagnosis? Quote, does this mean procedures or more typically more frequent scans, et cetera? By, by definition, overdiagnosis is the diagnosis of a condition that would not become clinically relevant had it been not diagnosed. So for example, with, it's, it's, not, it's different than a false positive. With a false positive, you have a positive test, you get a biopsy um, or you get a follow-up and proven to be a false positive and you're done. And, 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 and that's, that's a harm, but it's not as big as overdiagnosis because you don't end up treating the patient. You tell the patient they don't have the disease and everything turns out to be okay uh, after the initial mishap. With overdiagnosis, and this is something that's, I think, very confusing to providers and to patients. With overdiagnosis, what happens is you find something, you biopsy it, it looks like cancer under the microscope, and then you treat the patient, and you never find out that that was an overdiagnosis. So one of the really complicated things with overdiagnosis, you never identify who has been overdiagnosed at the individual level. All you know from these large screening studies is that a certain percentage, of those people that you've treated, were overdiagnosed. So. Um, so if a patient has a diagnosis, they're treated, they, they, they're supposedly cured, you really don't know for sure. This, this pertains to any cancer and any disease. Uh, if they were actually cured or their condition would not have become clinically relevant. Now, as I showed before, it, it depends dramatically on what they found. Now, if they find a four, a four centimeter nodule, then the chance that that's overdiagnosed is about zero. Uh, but if you're talking about one of these little wispy sub-centimeter ground glass opacities, then there's you know, a fair likelihood that, that it's like the prost small prostate cancer that this would not have become clinically significant. At a level. But it depends critically on what you're actually finding. But it is a complicated concept. And the only way to get an estimate of how bad it is is with a, a population-based study. And you'll never figure it out at the individual level. This, again, it's a, it's a key concept for shared decision making because a lot of people just don't get this. It's actually easier to understand if you're going from prostate cancer because if you're, you're old and you have comorbidities, it's a little bit easier to understand that, okay, this tiny little one millimeter thing that they find is not really going to affect me over the next couple of years. It's a much more difficult concept for a younger person. Great. Thank you, Dr. Black. So the next question is, as a patient advocate and president of Free Maine from Lung Cancer, what are some things that we and other advocates can do to help speed up the process of these studies to streamline the process for the provider and the patient? I see the complexity of screening a patient for low dose CT may be, may be a deterrent for the provider and therefore may not refer the patient out for the screening? Yes. Um, well, it's hard for me to know exactly what you can do, what levers you can pull you know, in Washington. Uh, but one thing you certainly could do is would be when the U.S. Preventive Task Force comes out with their recommendations and there's a, a public comment period is bond. Uh, maybe, you know, organize uh, some focus group of uh, providers and uh, Screening centers and, and discuss it and uh, you know say what you need and you know communicate it to nationally or even to your state. Um, but I, uh, as I said before, I think a lot of these things are you're going to have more 
more leverage in doing it at a national level uh, than at a local level. And you really can't change the laws at a very local level. Great, thank you. So I think at this point, I'll double check. I think that's the last of our questions. So again, we'll give everyone just another minute or so to see if you have any more questions for Dr. Black before we wrap up. We have about, just to do a quick time check, about five minutes left in the presentation. So we'll give everyone a minute. If anyone has anything else I'd like to ask, this is your opportunity. So please ask what we have in here. I don't see any of the questions coming in right now. What we will do, if any come in as we're wrapping up, Dr. Black, we will compile those and then send those to you. And then we'll send that out when we, you know, send out the, the, the monkey survey for the CME. So again, just a reminder for those that you may be joining us with a group, please put uh, your information in the chat box or email us. And we will get the survey monkey out in about a week or so. And again, we ask you all that can that are interested in seeing me to complete that, and then we will be sending the CMEs out in about a month for everyone. So on behalf of the Maine Lung Cancer Coalition, Dr. Black, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been incredibly helpful, a wealth of information, and great to have your knowledge and expertise. So thank you so much for your time today. We are grateful and really appreciate it. Thank you all also that have joined us today for this webinar. We appreciate your time as well, and we look forward and hoping that you'll join us with the next Maine Lung Cancer Coalition webinar that we will be having in a few months. So again, I want to thank everyone for joining us today, and and have a wonderful rest of your day. Well, thank you very much, Jessica, and thank, thanks to all the listeners. Absolutely. Thank you again. And Dr. Black, if you want to stay on for a few minutes, we'll wrap up with you. Okay. All right, great. Thank you, everyone.